Well, I'll tell you the reason I, I started flying is when I was a kid, I know there wasn't anything more exciting than see an airplane, and I knew every airplane, built every model I could find. And so uh, what I wanted to do is be an airline pilot. So in 1937, I was going to college, Pacific Lutheran, and uh, they offered what they called civilian pilot training, CPT. And the government paid for flying, and so I mean, this is a dream because at that time it was like thirty dollars an hour, which is unheard of as far as you know getting a license. The government would pay your license all the way up to fifty or some hours, and so for about two hours a day, I'd go out to a, a little place and fly, which later proved kind of a bum deal because I didn't go to school that much that, that semester. Well, the second semester I decided that, you know, it was about time I settled down because I had to have two years of college in order to get into the Air Force, which was my whole idea. Well, during this time, I, in 38, and uh, I finished the primary, and then I took what you call secondary, which was a bigger airplane, and this is, I started out in a 60-horse Cub, which is a small single-wing plane, and then I took uh, flying lessons in a WACO, UP-7, which had a 125-horse radial engine, which was a tremendous thing. And anyway, the Army used them as primary trainers, which, you know, didn't interest me one way or the other. I finished that up and then I took advanced training and I went to Yakima and I flew a staggered wing, well anyway, it was a beautiful aircraft uh, and I learned how to do instruments because I knew how to fly, I had my license and I knew how to fly but I had to have instrument training because that's where a lot of the pilots ran into trouble. Was some of these clouds had little hard rocks in the middle of them, and that's, you know, you had to learn how to use the instruments. In the meantime, guess what? The war come along, and so the only thing I got to do is to either join the Army or the Navy. And so I had a buddy, and he found out through the Army, he and I went to the Army, and we passed our test. He found out he was colorblind. I passed. So I didn't know what to do. Well, anyway, Dick went on up to Canada and joined the Canadian Air Force. And I heard that uh, I could go to the Navy and they were playing, paying $500 a year bonus. So I thought that was real neat. Yeah. So I just took the Navy test and I flunked it. Well, it took me another six months to pass that test. Well, by this time, I, we're well into the war. We're like now into August and Sip. And so I finally passed, and then they, I got called, and they said, well, you can either go to primary training or learn how to fly, or you can go into this wonderful deal where you went to St. Mary's Pre-Flight School, and you could build up your body, and it was just like going to a a spa, you know, just marvelous deal. We played golf, tennis, and did this for 16 weeks to build up your body. And I thought, man, I couldn't beat anything like that. Well, actually, I found out it was a torture machine. I mean, they really just worked out a living daylights out of you. And instead of taking eight weeks, it took me 16 weeks because I got a knee injury. So from there, I went to what we call primary training. Primary training, you learn how to fly. Of course, I already knew how to fly, so our syllabus at that time was cut short. Each syllabus was cut by so many hours because we knew how to land. But of course, I didn't know how to land like the Navy wanted. The Navy wanted to land on three points. That's the two wheels and a tail skid. I used to come in, which we call grease in, and land on two wheels. That was the Army way. And of course, I was criticized because they knew that I had taken Navy uh, Army training. It was kind of hard for me to come in in kind of a three-point attitude and drop down on the ground, but I soon learned how to land an airplane the rough way. Well, to make a long story short, I went through primary and then secondary training, and then keep, each time we'd advance on to a different syllabuses, 
and finally wound up in Texas and went through advanced training. I went through gunnery, went through uh, radio. Of course, each plane we wanted to do was more advanced. Uh, I was used to flying a plane that didn't have uh, flaps, so we used to what we called, we would slip and we'd put the plane at an angle and drop down and land into a field. Instead of using, we didn't have flaps, then finally the first plane we had on was called a, was built by Volte. We called them a Volte vibrator that they had flaps and used to crank them down with a hand crank. And man, this is really something. You come in, you know, and it's just like a big plane now, and all you got flaps. Uh, so the next thing we would have was going to have the Texan, and that was going to be a little more advanced training. We got into gunnery, well, then we were going to fly the Texan. Well, each one of these planes, we had to do so much groundwork, and then after we got in there, we had to have an instructor take us out and teach us how to land the plane, show us the different things. And boy, this Texan, I thought it was just the most marvelous plane I'd ever seen in my life. It was all metal, and it had retractable landing gear. It had twin 50s up in the nose. And it was just like a regular, a regular aircraft, other than you wouldn't want to go to war and such a thing. Finally, we got through all that deal, and doing radio and and all the instrument work. And the day came when I got my wings. Well, then of course you figure, well, you're either you have to go to an advanced school of some kind, either dive bombing, fighters, or bombers. And they were real uh, eager for dive bombers for some reason. So I went to dive bombing school down in Miami, Florida, and we flew old, old aircraft. They, I can't even remember what the name of. I think they were called BTs, but they were an old plane. They had corrugated wings, and I do mean corrugated. Uh, you know what a corrugated metal roof is? Their wings were corrugated. And you had bomb sites, and those bomb sites was a tube that you looked through, and it was uh, an old plane, but it was at one time was the number one plane for the Navy. And then now, of course, they had this new advanced one called an SBD. Well, <clears throat> I learned how to dive bomb, and I got through there, and then they said, "Well, we're not quite ready for you, so we're going to send you through fighter school." So I went through. Fighter school, and I flew F 2As, Brewster Buffaloes. Not many people know about them, but there was an article in Life magazine about six months ago that said, you know, that was the worst airplane ever built. It was the only plane I ever flew that had a you know, tag in there that said if the engine quits to bail out because it would glide like a rock. Went through fighter school, and by then the guy said, well, the best thing that we can know now is to send you off to the West Coast. That's, that's, why, that's why I live in the West Coast. And I got my first 30-day leave. And that's, I've been gone away from home now for almost a year and a half. <coughs> so I took off from Miami, Florida, went to Chicago, and learned how to to uh, land an airplane on a, on a carrier. And they had a, a couple old tankers up there that they turned <coughs> into carriers, put on steel decks and I landed, uh, had five landings and one of this SNJ, which was a plane I really loved, but it was not built to land on carriers because the hook was just hung down and just by gravity and when you wanted it up, a guy came underneath the plane, pulled it up and then you took the rope and put the slack around your armrest. So the five of us took off that morning and we flew out there and we made five landings and soon we got through the fifth landing. I was carrier qualified, which meant now uh, usually was, you'd have to be sent on board a carrier. You wouldn't be land based. So they sent me out to uh, make base would be Alameda, California. And this is where I first flew uh, what I call the uh, uh, aircraft that it was you could actually use it for combat. It was called the SVD. And of course, there was an entirely different program. We learned how to fly in formation. We learned how to dive bomb. And this is the first time we ever had a man in the back seat and I had a gunner 
a radio man, and he was the he was the uh, he had wanted to fly, and this is his way of flying was being the back seat. So I asked him. I said, "Well, why did you? How come you got it in my uh, plane?" He says, "Well, there was two of us, and he said that." Your two of you came in that day, and you're Beetle and Freet, and so we're going to flip coins. Who is going to get who? Because he said we heard both of you were pretty hot pilots. So <laughs> the Faro got me by by a flip. So that meant the Faro was going to be in the back seat, and that meant he was going to go with me on board a carrier into combat. So of course, <clears throat> the time had just you know now a whole year has gone by, and it's still. A, I'm in the United States, I'm nowhere near any combat, so we fly on different stations down the, in the Pacific coast. Alameda was where we, 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 we joined, and then uh, we went from there to uh, Watsonville, and Crow's Landing, Santa Maria, and there was another couple other little fields that <coughs> we, we flew out of. Uh, we learned to dive bomb, and we um, one month we had a new skipper came in, and we dive bombed probably eight hours a day, seven days a week. And I mean, we just went out and we drive dive ten times. We had these little practice bombs in our wing, and this Rocky was sent us out, and we thought, man, this is. This is really hell. I have to go out and learn how to. But we got real good at dive bombing, and so we were thankful for that later on. So after we finished all the different phases there, most of it was night flying. We learned how to land on a carrier at night, which is a eerie thing. I mean, I have nightmares yet thinking about coming on board a carrier at night. Daytime was was rough enough, but at night it was it was a horrible experience because you'd be out there in the water and there'd be no actual visual uh, way to see you know the horizon, and you'd fly by instruments 250 feet above the water, fly by time they make you turn and then you turn around and finally make another turn and this you should be able to see the ship now the ship had lights were like, I call them scuppers, that they'd only see the light shining backwards. You, that's the only way you could see it is coming straight on. Then here was a guy sitting up in front of this thing. It looked like he's suspended in the air, and that's a landing signal officer, and he's got on reflective clothing. And you can see this arm sticking straight out. It looks like he's standing on nothing. And you're coming in on one straight line of lights, and this guy standing up, and, and you see the flag cross over, which meant cut your engine, <coughs> which then we'd land. So we had to get five landings in. Well, there was about, you see, there was, that time we lost five guys at, uh, and uh, on uh, night flying that missed the deck, hit the deck, hit the water, and, you know, it was, it was really a toughie. Uh, we're now we're qualified for night carrier landings, which is oh, meant we could be night fighters if we we're you know we happen to be lucky or unlucky. So next thing you know is uh, they said well, we're going to send you to Hawaii, and there you wait for your ship, and, uh, and then you go out into combat. Well, they didn't know that combat then meant another year. We were six months on Hilo and six months on Oahu, flying different kinds of missions, flying night flying, dive bombing and dive bombing, and we do joint deals with the fleet. And finally, a year later, we get the word that we're going to board the USS Intrepid. So we get in our planes and we find the ship is like 150 miles off of Oahu and we all land aboard and that's from then on we're going to be part of the ship's company. There's already 36 fighters on board and there's a torpedo group on board 
and then out of dive bombers, so we're a complete unit. And now we're all ready to go to join the big fleet. Now this is when the fleet really, before that was a kind of a hit and run deal, but now we're, we're fully expanded. We've got more carriers and they know what to do with. So we, 19 days later, we had our first mission, which was kind of a farce, but it was a mission. It was over this little island and we had to bomb a bauxite mine. Well, first of all, I didn't know what the heck bauxite was, so I had to look it up in the dictionary and I found out it's, this is what they make aluminum out of. And uh, everybody drops 500 pound bombs on this poor little little, little mine that was on this island. It was about half the size of Vashon. And then we went back and everybody was experiencing about the anti-aircraft fire that was coming up. And it wasn't anti-aircraft fire, it was our own. When we go in there, we were shooting our 50s by the, the tracers that would bounce off of rocks and come up and they looked like the, the, somebody was shooting back. So we had a we had a great time on that. So it was soon after that we got to our first invasion. There was a little island in called Angora, and uh, the uh, island itself was probably half the size of Vashon Island, and it was completely rimmed by warships. And they had the big invasions there. First of all, I was seeing about 10,000 uh, Marines went on, on uh, their little uh, boats, and they had made a beach landing, and they they got stopped on this beach and they call for our support and they would mark with phosphorus bombs where they wanted us to bomb because it was so tight and this is the first time they really found out what integrity these Japanese had on these islands because we had very poor information. So we bombed that island for a week. We each day we'd go out We'd circle above till a guy below would say, so and so, I want you to bomb grid number so and so. We'd look on our maps, we'd call back, and we'd dive down. Of course, nobody would shoot back at us because they were so busy down below fighting about it. Then we'd get the okay, like, you know, that was a good, good attack. He was right on the target. Then we'd pull off and go back home. And this we went on for about two weeks. <laughs> then uh, soon, uh, we got orders then to leave there and go to the Philippines. We thought, gee, Philippines, you know, that was like, oh, it must be three or four hundred miles from there. So we steam off and away we go. And of course, people don't realize that these carriers can really zip through the water. I mean, they can do 35 miles an hour, and it's hard to believe, but they were so fast that the destroyers had a heck of a time keeping up with them. But this was the big punch that we had, that we had so much speed. And we went up to uh, the Philippines and went on the big island of Mindanao, and we had different uh, maps showing the airfields of the city of Davao, and said, first thing to do is to go in and destroy the airport. Well, we had pictures of the airport, a small little job, and went up there. Here, this field was loaded with aircraft. We just happened to catch them on the ground. We dropped bombs, bombed the, the place, we bombed the hangars, and then the fighters waited for the zeros down below to take off. They waited for them to take off. If they get airborne, then they'd shoot them down at the end of the field. So one guy came back, he had five, he had five planes to his credit. The, the first day he'd ever seen a Japanese aircraft. But this is, shows you what you know what war is like. It, it's so a happen chance. And they told us, you know, that if we went down not to, to land on Mindanao, not to go to Zamboango, because there is a some people who lived on that island that hated Japanese, they hated well they hated everybody, and the most people they hated was the Americans. And they said that, you know, they they were headhunters. So we'd always look over that island and say, Well, <laughs> If I get shot down, I'm sure going to go back to Mindanao. So then we went 
back the ship and the next day they said, well, uh, you're going to be carrying messages to the city of Duval and tell them we're going to burn the city down. So there was 36 of bombers and 12 torpedoes and about 25 fighters and we went over just about at dusk and we dropped incendiary bombs. The city was probably the size of Tacoma and it completely burned it down. I mean, it was just, just one raging thing. It just seemed like it would be impossible for anybody to escape. Anyway, we went back to the ship and landed and so they said, now we're going to go back to your little island that you were uh, used to bombing on. And he says, and so we went back, you know, this is uh, two weeks that progressed and the Marines had not advanced one inch from the, or we, they were still on the beach. So this is when they first started using, if I forget the term now, but it's a jelly type, uh, Napalm. Uh, napalm. And we have uh, 126 gallon belly tanks, which the fighter planes would use, and they fill it with napalm and they put an instantaneous fuse so with a jar of the thing it would blow up. And the, there was six of us they sent out, and we went out and they bombed this one mountain. And I was number six to go on the thing. and. Uh, I saw the things hit, but they weren't blowing up. And I dropped mine, mine by half, and it was the last one that it caught on fire. And the whole mountain looked just like it was like a volcano because all this stuff was running down. The, and boy, the Marines, they thought that was great. You know, this is the first time we'd ever seen this napalm. You know, this is, well, we were a little worried about this stuff because it's, it, you know, it's not exactly. Yeah, the safest stuff in the world because it's, and you had an instantaneous fuse which meant a jar we could send it off or it wouldn't send it off. It was very un, un, unpopular but we certainly learned uh, how to use it and it became a good weapon then. Later on they said well now this is what we're going to do is we're going to give you a package bomb on each wing and uh, says well now scratch our head what is a package bomb? Well it's it's five, five machine guns on each bomb, and there's hung from your wings. So I got ten machine guns and two 20 millimeter cannons, and each plane is fixed with this. And the the the, the machine guns are 50 caliber, and they are set up so that the only way to for them to be safe is just to run out of ammunition. It's not like the cannon; you can put the cannon on safe. You won't have to worry about it. But anyway, went out there and went on this island and they told us where to go. <laughs> I never saw so much land going up. And when the guys are coming down and there was, oh, there's probably 15 of us, you know, all coming down together and then firing all these things. And the guys down below said, man, that was wonderful. But we understood that the Japanese just went into their caves and as soon as we went flew by while they came back out again. <laughs> so this is the way war went on. It just kept going on, you know. We thought, well, this is a dull life, you know. Hadn't seen any kind of, uh, any kind of Japanese or any type of plane. So he says, now we're going to go back up to Leyte. Where's that? Well, that's up in the, in the main part of the Philippines, this is where their proposed landing is going to be. Where MacArthur comes back, he's going to land at Leyte. So we said, well, whatever MacArthur wants, I guess <laughs> we'll have to go. But went up there and uh, we saw a lot of Japanese planes. I mean, guys come back, we had Japanese, we, we attacked by five, six, seven, or ten, twelve of them that would come in on our. And we, then found out what the Jap Zero was like. See those guys coming in, and zipping in at about a low altitude, would be at 500 feet, and flip over on their back and do a split S, which pulled out. You know, if an F6F tried that way, he'd be 600 feet underground. They were very maneuverable, but they were also very, very uh, vulnerable to any kind of a 
bullets because they just fly apart. They were, you know, become very incendiary and would blow up on a moment's notice. In fact, we had one of them that went into a loop, started on the top of the loop, and there was a, a, a F6F right behind him. And he got to the top of the loop where the guy bails out, and, uh, and, uh, and the guy floats away, and the plane starts back down, and the F6F pilot, he, he snap rolled out and came back around, and then he fired, and he shot down the plane, but there was nobody in it. The pilot was already out. So that was our first kill that we had seen, you know. The, of course, but then the gunners, had, you know, they didn't get a chance to get we didn't close enough to get to them. But after that, we went to different, of course, the Philippines, it's just tremendous, tremendous, tremendous amount of islands that are involved in that thing. They talk the Philippines, and every inch of ground out there, there was some kind of a little round piece of ground. And we used to fly over a thousand of these islands. And we found one place that had four great big uh, warships uh, full of troops and here was eight of us and we were all fully loaded with bombs where they weren't armor piercing but they were <clears throat> so the skipper said we got up to 15,000 feet rolled over and dove on the things and the targets were so neat that all of us got so excited that we all missed I mean here was eight planes four big ships and they're all full of Japanese troops and we miss except one got a near miss and the half of the concussion blew plates out of the ship started to sink and it's made a whirl around and headed for the beach so the skipper says well what else are we going to do the only thing we got left is our 20s so he divided us up and each four planes would take a ship and we dove on them and we sunk all, all of them the, those troop transports with 20 millimeter cannon, which we didn't realize what a potent weapon it was until that day we used it. So anyway, um, this is, you know, how war goes. It's, you know, one day it's dull and the next day there's so much stuff going on that you, you can't believe. So we go around to Leyte and find more Air, airports, find different kind of troop transports, and then they said, well now we want you to go up to Manila, and so we all, the two ships, our group was, TRAS Group 38.2, took off and went up to Corregidor. So there we saw, actually where the war started, and the harbor was just full of ships, Japanese ships, and it said, uh, each one of us took a ship of our own and went, dove on the thing and dropped a bomb and each one of us got hits on the ships because they weren't moving, they were just stationary targets. And that was a real field day, you know, we came back and uh, one of the planes got a Jap Zero, the gunners, the Zero was trying to sneak up on the, uh, on behind us in this gunner on one of the S, uh, one of the SB2Cs fired and knocked this uh, guy down. That's the first time we, our um, planes had ever got a, a Jap Zero. Yeah. So it's, the gunners felt real good because here they're sitting back there champing at the bit, you know, haven't, haven't fired their 30s in, in two years, you know, so anyway, to make a long story short, why we progressed around different areas in Corregidor and up north, <coughs> and uh, then we bombed Clark Field, which is a big airfield there, which the Japanese had improved by about 90% of what pictures we had. And just to tell you how funny things are in this war, we had, after I got through with the bombing the airfield, I. I was flying out to this mountain, it's, I forget the name of it, but it's the one that just exploded not too long ago. I had a volcano right there in Manila, and it's a little mountain that kind of just pokes its 
nose right out of the flat ground and here's his peak comes up and we used to use that as a way to go out and uh, rendezvous. That was our rendezvous point after we got finished with Clark Hill. I, we dove that day from about 15,000 and I pushed over opened my flaps but they wouldn't open so I went straight down without flaps and sitting he is sitting in about 300 miles an hour I hit about 450 miles an hour and pulls out and I'm so far ahead of everybody and when I went out across this field my gunner says well there's a whole field down there is full of Jap Bettys which is a twin engine bomber well the funny part of it is my my gunner cheated because he was colorblind and he cheated in order to get in but this camouflage he could see right through it. I looked down there and all I could see was houses and streets. So he said, well, look over the left side and he says, right straight down there, you can see these streets running there in parallel. And he says, they all look real nice and straight. And yeah, he says, well, that's not a, not a town, that's an airfield. And he says, it's full of Betty's. So I called, by then I, Beetle was behind me and I said, Beetle, I said, I want to make a run down through this thing. There's a whole Jap field of Bettys down below. And I says, and if I get any of them, I, then you'll know where they are. So I made a run there and I just walked the cannon all the way through the thing. And all of a sudden these flames started bursting up and Beetle says, oh boy, now I see where it is. Because you can see the, well, the netting that they had up there. It started to burn off and exposed the thing. So we flew around there at 1,500 feet and the gunners were firing at the to give them a chance. So we flew around, flew around, finally there were so many of them. And uh, I called in for a group of F6Fs. If there was any around, there was a fires over in this area and there's a whole field of Bettys and we couldn't get them all. We didn't have enough ammunition. So they said, well, we'll come over. And so there was about eight F6Fs. And they made a run through there. And the very last guy that made a run through, now the F6S is probably doing about 300, 400 miles an hour going through that thing. They picked him off and this whole field up. By then, they got to their guns and here we were flying at 1,500 feet. We didn't even know that they had guns down there. So we got back to the radio room and I said to Beetle, I said, well, that's no more of that uh, going around and chasing and looking for you know, targets of opportunity. I said, that's for the birds, because we had, they could have picked us off with a rifle, because we were flying around about mm -hmm. 140 miles an hour looking down at this airfield, you know, what a nice area, you know, and, and watch these planes burn, but then we see one of our own aircraft get knocked down. Anyway, well, we used to go out on what we called extra deals, go out, we used to look, look for trains, that was Beetle, my favorite, was finding trains. Trains was easy to find because you could always see smoke anywhere, you know, on tracks. And, but we'd go after the troop trains and stuff. Anyway, it from then on we went back and to Manila and we worked over the areas and finally they said, well now it's about time that the invasion is coming, and so we're going to be in an advanced deal. We're going to send you guys up to Formosa, which is quite a ways up north, closer to Japan, and we'd be kind of a diversionary force, catch anything and coming down to, to stop uh, when the invasion came on in Leyte. So we go up to Formosa. And then the first day we go in there, there was 12 planes, and there was eight of us, nine. There was 10 planes got through the thing, and uh, one plane got shot down. And uh, it was the first time we'd ever seen one of the guys get shot down, diving straight down. We figured out that they must have had radar because you. Radar was the only thing you could set a fuse fast enough to catch you going straight down. So, next day we went, they had a material made out of aluminum strips, and you'd throw that out, and it would it would fuzz up the radar, and, it would, and they couldn't 
couldn't get a good target. So they said to just to put out handfuls of it, and you know, it was 12 planes in each of the planes. The guy was grabbing both hands, and one guy was threw out a whole bale. I mean, gee, we came back. I had a bunch of that stuff in my air cooler. You know, the air was so full of it, and it stopped him all right. So we figured, well, we went a little farther advanced, but go to this big city of Davao, or not Davao, uh, was the name of that place. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, my section editor said, you know, that we'd have to, when we pulled out, we were going to pull out and go north, and then we would circle the city and then go on out, and then we'd catch our, the rest of the group, we were going to diversionary, go out over uh, this other city to see if any targets over there. But anyway, and the uh, in the interim, I, it was myself, MG was in the second plane, and then Larson was our uh, section leader. There was the three of us, and uh, anyway, he got hit going down, and uh, the gunner was knocked out, and he had trouble with his fla wing flaps, and it had punctures in his tanks. And he also got hit by a small arms that had gone through this cockpit and into the armor plate and splintered off onto his shoulder, so he was wounded. So when I come on him, he was flying straight and level, but going like a bomb, and it's awful hard to catch anybody when they're going straight ahead. So I firewalled my thing as far as I go and then gave it water injection so it wouldn't blow the cylinders up. and. Uh, Finally caught him, and just as I got up there, there was a plane a zero was sitting on his lap, and was firing into him. And he, I don't know, he put in like 27 holes into his wings, <coughs> and he didn't see me coming. And so I, I had to go down and come up under him because I didn't want to fire down because I'd fired. I hit Larson, and I, I hit him in the tail, and knocked his blew his tail completely off. Which was a, he was as surprised as I was. Well, anyway, there was four of them. That was three left. So MG and I said, "Well, let's go into what we call a tactical deal, where both of us would sit and and fly tight formation. And each time the plane would come in, why we would is the time we get into range of firing, where we turn into it. And when we turn into it." and make him turn that much sharper. Anyway, uh, the second time we came in, I hear the plane wiggles, and he's, we can tell when he's going to come in, because they, they had at the one time two on each side, and finally the guy wiggled and make it worn in. And, and as soon as we started to turn, my we could see the sparkle. He knew that he was firing then, and he was getting tighter and tighter, and he couldn't get in tight enough, and I said to the gunner, next time he comes through, I says, he's going to come up on the other side, catch him on that other side, because then, by then his speed is, you know, is is gone, and he just kind of set up there and all by himself, and the gunner caught him and put in 1,200 rounds in that zero step, and you know, he got a, right from the Calling all the way through. I mean, he just practically tore the airplane apart. The guy bailed out, but I don't think he was in very good shape. But let me make a long story short. My gunner got a distinguished flying cross for that because that was a he got his he was one of the first ones to get a jab zero, which was a, gunners were real eager because that's an awful boring job to have some guy out in front there dive bombing and you have to sit back there. So by then uh, there's, I'd taken one out, yeah. the gunner had taken one out so there's only two left and they were discouraged. They decided they better not fool around with those terrific bombers. <laughs> so <clears throat> I went up next to Larson and he was flying at about 150 feet off of the water and I asked him to come up and point it up, and he sh shook his head. He didn't want to. So, I, 
said to my gunner, I said, well, I'm going to go up and then we'll take a fix and find out where the ships are because by then we'd gone all around different places. I didn't know where we were. We'd flown all over. And we had a radio beacon and a gunner took a shot on the thing. We had to make a 120 degree <coughs> correction. I nodded it. I was going to lead and Larson's okay because I knew Larson was all right, but his gunner was, was draped over his gun rail. I figured he was dead. So, and I could see that uh, all his instruments was all, all blown apart and everything. So we made a correction and we got into the ship. And I called in and told him that we had one guy that was playing to bring him in at any cost because I don't think he could make another turn. The pilot's wounded and the gunner's dead. So and to make a long story short, why Larson made it on the first pass. So and the MG and I both landed later. Well, it turned out to be that the gunner wasn't dead, but he was so close to it that he had another 10 minutes he would have been dead because of uh, bleeding to death. Well, one of the things, of course, is the higher up you go, the more you'll bleed. So that's one reason why Larson stayed down low. And the other reason is that he said if he passed out, he said he was going to feel like he was going to pass out, he was going to cut the gun and he just let the a plane go into the water from the lower altitude. He figured maybe he might come out of it. Uh, the funny part of it is that Larson was one of a, I flew with him on a navigation hop one time and he didn't think I was too much of a navigation pilot and he says, I sure wouldn't want you to lead me anywhere when I, in the war. And of course, he'd been out there one time before. This is his second trip out. Well, to make a long story short, Larson, was wherever I was or wherever Larson was, he'd jump up and jump up and say, this is the guy that saved my ass, no matter where he was. Yeah. And he, I guess he was pretty, uh, he always wanted to buy me drinks and everything because I was his friend for life from then on. A couple of guys I think made it to China, we're not sure, we never did hear from them because they never showed up in Formosa. We, uh, I left, uh, we were in Formosa, I should explain that Formosa uh, later on was known as Taiwan, which now is known as Taiwan. Uh, we were actually only 70 miles from the mainland of China, so we were issued uh, jackets that had the American flag on the sleeve, and in this sleeve there was enough Chinese money to last us three months over in China we could, if we got shot down. One of my roommates, uh, a real close friend of mine, uh, got shot down and later on his brother joined our squadron and his brother was got the information he even found out where he was shot down in the Formosa and he sent me a a paper that was uh, done by American uh, in the Army and they go over and they research all of these areas where planes have gone down ser searching for people that were lost in World War II because uh, there are many, many, many thousands that they never found the bodies, just like in Vietnam. It, it's not, it's not uh, Unheard of, uh, you know, Vietnam. You know, this missing person was, the, you know, that they had him in Russian prison camps and different places. But some of those areas are so remote that it it's practically impossible to find them. So <clears throat> after the experience of with uh, the four zeros, uh, we headed back for the ship and landed. And the next day we were told to go back to, uh, <coughs> we were going to go back to Leyte because that's the second day of the invasion and we'll go back there and support the invasion. MacArthur was going to land and, and his troops landed at Formosa, or at uh, 
excuse me, at Leyte. So we speed back, which took us about a week to get back there. And by then, uh, the troops had already secured uh, Leyte. In fact, MacArthur had already made his famous landing. And we got to see the newsreels of it, which we thought was a real laugh. You know, but this is the second time he marched into land there, and you know, the, he came out of a, a boat and then he walked in on the water, and very ceremoniously took over Leyte. He says, I shall return, and he finally did. <laughs> anyway, uh, then it would just, uh, I had a few missions around Leyte, and then uh, one day I came home on a, getting ready to land on the ship, and I said to the gunner, I said, well, it must be <coughs> having firing practice. I see the Gunners on board our ship are firing. We could see any aircraft going off. <coughs> Excuse me. And on, when I went to land, I felt this flame on the side of my face and looked over, and the whole left side of the ship is on fire. And what had happened is that a Japanese plane had made a run on the ship, and this is the first time that they really initiated what they call a kamikaze. And this kamikaze that made a run, and the uh, gunners were on that side that manned them. There was 40 20 millimeter cannons, and they were uh, the black stewards manned this thing. And it was the guy that run the thing was an Indian, and they, that was his crew. And the guys kept firing, even though they knew that they were going to be hit by this plane. So. Uh, I started up and I couldn't go because I was hooked up on the hook and a guy come out and disengaged the hook and then I finally pulled forward and guys were laying all around the deck and I kind of taxied around and folded my wings and finally some guy come out and he put, put me into a slot and told me to cut the engine. I cut the engine and we got out. <coughs> of course, I got called by the captain and said that, you know, he gave me, asked me what a wonderful job I'd done, you know, that had, had gone ahead and without uh, anybody telling me what to do is it took my plane out of the fire that was down there by the end of the ship. And of course, I didn't really know what was going on. I had an idea when I saw that uh, that ship was on the fire that something, had, you know, I thought maybe a, a one of our own planes had hit and, and, <coughs> and burned or something. So I was ignorant of what was going on, but they then knew that they really meant, because they were talking about these kamikazes, and they noticed a couple of them uh, had made feints where they had pointed down towards the ship. But of course, most of them never made it because they get shot out of the air before they even got out of the, the area. Uh, then the Japan announced that they were going to send out fleets of these kamikazes, and some of those poor guys only had 20 hours in the aircraft. Some of them, you know, that's all they knew how to do, take off. They didn't know really how to land, send them out there and die for their country, which is a uh, I blame Japan and the big shots of Japan for, you know, initiating such a deal. Of course, we knew about backup bombs, where your bombs carried underneath the Jap Betty, and this guy would be inside of the thing, and he would guide the bomb. And uh, and we, had, of course, those planes would usually get shot down before they get near any ship. They had out and sent out night fighters at night and go out and vector them out onto these, and these uh, by radar. And of course, these guys flying in the airplane, they didn't know anything about what was going on because all they knew was there was hunting for a ship. And then all of a sudden, here an airplane would shoot them out of the sky. They didn't even know there was anyone near there. So it was a 
kind of a cat and mouse thing there. We we did uh, quite a few different sorties around. We found some light. One day they found a lifeboat with about 20 guys in it. Was off of some uh, freighter that said he was going along, and all of a sudden uh, one of our submarines out there would and torpedoed them, and they they were lucky they got out of the thing. In fact, well, every day that we went out, uh, there was a different code that we'd call in, and the code was usually somebody in the newspaper and a funny, like Superman or Mr. Jiggs or Mr. Hoople, or they had different names. Of them. That was for the station where the submarines were already out there and knew where we were, and if the guys had got, you know, run out of gas and they give their location and they get picked up by our own sub. We heard one night where the submarine was, uh, and it was an afternoon and he was in Tokyo Harbor and he was gave us the scores of the, they were having a ball game. And we thought we were, we thought we were having a tough deal and here is a submarine that had followed another freighter and followed it in, into the harbor up there in Tokyo. Those guys are just absolutely fearless. Uh, actually, we were more fearless than they realized because we had this poor equipment. Our our uh, torpedoes were just terrible. I went out one day with a on a patrol with a torpedo plane and myself. We covered a certain area, and we ran across the tooth tack. A freighter, and I said, "Well, I'll go up above and make a dive bombing run on. You can make a run on him with a torpedo." So everything went fine, and I dropped my bomb, got a hit, and a torpedo came right up to the ship. And then I made a U-turn, came back, and went back to the beach and blew up. You know, this is on this way. Had to, you know, you couldn't go over 120 knots. The Japanese used to come in there at 400 miles an hour and drop one of those. Torpedoes and they would never miss, you know. Just had terrible torpedoes. They finally got them straightened out, but they talked about, you know, about the superior equipment of the United States. Well, it wasn't always superior. We had a lot of things that weren't. One of them was torpedoes. So um, by then, uh, things got kind of nasty. Japan was going to have to make a move. And it was to bring their fleet down there and try to get everybody out of the Philippine area and have the big battle of the, of the big battleships. And there's always waiting for these the group coming down from the north. And we're around in the Philippine area at that time. And we had a fellow on board a ship named Max Adams, and he was the first one to discover the Japanese fleet coming down, which, excuse me, included a, two large battleships and cruisers and dozens and dozens of cruisers and battleships and everything. So the next day, we, there was only two ships that were in that area at that time. The others were being in, uh, getting provisioned and we had already provisioned it. So they said, uh, well, you're going to have to take off and bomb the Jap fleet at night. And I remember the date, it was October 23rd because that's my birthday and I had written a deal and I found out what they meant by <laughs> that we were expendable because we knew that there would be only a one-way hop. For us to go out there and bomb a battleship with our radar that we had on, and the battleships we had so much better that they'd probably shoot us out of the air before we even got near them. We wouldn't know that we were near them, but it was kind of a tragedy. So anyway, to make a short story a long way, finally they said, well, they didn't have the right position and we'd go the very first thing in the morning. So we had breakfast at 4 o'clock and we had steak and eggs. Boy, I'll tell you, the steak was, we'd been living off of 
worst race. And I don't know where they got the stakes from. They must have saved them. We got on board and then we all took off and, and started for the fleet. And Max, then Max got the position on the exact fleet and we knew where they were. So we took off and went for it. They were about 180 miles from where we were. So we carried big belly tanks. We got near them, we all dropped our belly tanks. And of course I flew off of a, a section leader. And finally the guy said, well there's a fleet. And so then I looked down and there was more surface craft than there were airplanes in the air. So the leader says, well I'm gonna go for the battleships, and whatever you guys wanna do, go for a ship and stay right on it. So. Battleships were the largest ones down there, so we were the second. There was six went ahead of us, and then there were the next three to go. And in the dive, and I looked down, and here's this huge battleship. And I thought, gosh, I might have made a mistake. We're diving on the Iowa or on New Jersey because it had this pinch bow. It looked exactly like an American ship. But then I saw the meatball flag on it. I knew it was a Japanese. <laughs> so I dropped my bomb and pulled out and each ship fired their own aircraft and each ship had their own color so the air was just full of different bursts of color. Then the guys were shooting these phosphorus bombs which when they exploded they sent out spirals and, and it was stuff would get on the plane would eat a hole right through the thing. <laughs> we hoped it wouldn't get any of that in the cockpit. Anyway, I pulled out and everything went fine and didn't get hit. I <coughs> joined up on a group and heck, there was all the guys who had made it back except uh, MG and he <coughs> had a small hole in one of the cylinders and the cylinder was it was missing and kind of jerky. You could see the cowling twist, but he made it all the way back and uh, all landed. Of course, then we told him what we. And the guy asked me what I hit, and I said, well, I hit the forward turret with a thousand pound armor piercing. And he says, well, what is the damage you did? And I said, well, my gunner said all it did was dent it. And he said, well, uh, what ship was it? And I said, well, I don't know, but I said, it had a huge pinch bow on it thing. And he says, well, it did it look like this? And, it, and, it, and, it, and I said, yeah, exactly like that. And it looks just uh, like the Iowa, New Jersey. And he says, well, that's the... Musashi, and he said the Yamamoto, there was two of them, he says, and they're not even supposed to be out, they're supposed to be still in the shipyards in Japan, they're not, a, I said, well, they're out now. <laughs> well, as it happened, the Musashi is what we went after. It got crippled up and we knocked out most of the radar, and they, they, the same fleet went after a small group of, uh, down south in Subic Bay, and that's where they went after those small carriers. And I had a friend who was on a small carrier, and he says these big ships would fire these huge guns and fire these shells the size of a Volkswagen Beetle and go right straight through the ship before they it would explode. It was their their um, radar was all off, which we had knocked out, which is uh, it saved them. And then during the night, a uh, submarine got in there. And of course, those submarines were all, nobody knew where they were all the time. And one of them got in there and sunk the, one of the big ships. And when I was in my dive going down, I was looking through the, my scope and watching the, the ship as it was twisting and turning. And I saw a torpedo making a mark for a Bogami class cruiser, cruiser, and the one of the guys that overshot this ship that I was trying to bomb and hit this Bogami class cruiser right midships, and the thing looked like it just like sucked water for about a half a mile, and when the when the explosion is all over with, there wasn't any ship left. There was nothing there. I mean, there was. Probably 3,000 men died instantly right there. It just, uh, it 
and it probably hit a magazine. And of course, that was the end of that ship. But the the big battleships, they were hit by torpedoes, but they had such these large bubbles on the side that they took hits. That it slowed them down a little bit, but the only time it stopped one of them got hit in the <coughs> rudder, so it didn't have an all complete steering. And then later on, the, the submarines got to that ship, and it was sunk with all hands on board. It was a terrific loss of life. Well, it, it, uh, we heard is what had happened that the carriers went on one side of the Philippine Islands and um, battleships and cruisers went on the other side. And so the next day we have to go out and go after the carriers. So we thought, well, anyway, we're going to have a lot of help because by then all the guys had got refueled, all the ships were back in place. And, so the next day we were at 20,000 feet and we waited for almost an hour before we could go in and bomb. We had to wait our turn to bomb the ships. That's how many aircraft we And we were getting madder and madder because we could see each, they had four carriers and we saw two of them were sinking. There was only two left and by the time we got there, the two that we were going after were on fire had already been hit. So. And when we got through, the other two was sunk, so that was the end of the carriers. <clears throat> but a carrier is really neat to hit because it's flat, it's like a big piece of ground, you know, and, it's, and uh, this one here had a, a huge design on it, like a, like a big eye with the eye, it was, was deals shooting out on it from the, on the deck. It was like shooting a, a bullseye, you know, for a, a target, I remember. I planted that, I practically put the bomb exactly where I wanted it. And it, it was down. And I pulled up and the two guys behind us and, and about 10 minutes later by the ship itself. And that's a large, it's a large carrier. <coughs> <coughs> so anyway, went back to the ship, we was all happy. And, and we become all become heroes because you're a hero when you get to j bomb the Jap Navy. And uh, so from then on, was said, well, this is all going to be downhill. You know, there's going to be nothing left. Well, then it was we thought it was bad when well, they had kamikazes, and every night they'd have 40 and 50 and 60 and 100 planes that come in at night. Seeking out our ships to bomb them at night, you know, with, a, with these kamikazes. It was, you know, pretty, pretty bum. Well, I developed a heck of a cold. Next day I was supposed to go out on a hop, and anyway, I went to the doc to see if I get my ears blown out or something. He said, "Well, you can't go up." He says, "You'll rupture your eardrums, you know, going through the different." Uh, from 20,000 feet down to 1,500 feet is pretty fast. We used to go to about 350 knots. And if you know discomfort you can get in an airplane when you go to different uh, altitudes. So I stayed below and, and didn't go on the hop. Uh, so I went down and at about 9 o'clock I played bridge with a bunch of guys down in the wardroom. Anyway, I, had, I just learned how to play bridge and I was bidding a small, small, uh, what is it they call them? Anyway, slam. small slam. And uh, there was a kind of a bumps and you could hear the five inches firing off because it was really shaking the ship. The guy said, well, I suppose they're going after another kamikaze. And, and we said, yeah, pretty soon the ventilator, this real deep black smoke come out of this ventilator. And I said, well, boy, something must be on fire because that ventilator is putting smoke into this room. So we each took our napkin out and dipped it and we had tea and it dipped it in the tea and wrapped it around there because it was getting pretty black. And a guy came in with a helmet and a life jacket and on and he says, a forward magazine's on fire. And of course, 
I said to one of the black stewards, it was where the forward magazine is. He says, sir, we're on top of that forward magazine. But I said, well, I made a race for the door. I beat him to the door. We got outside and then we realized our ship had got hit and this bumps that we heard was the two kamikazes that hit us. The ship was on fire from one end to the other. Was this the Intrepid? Yeah. And I, the old USS Intrepid. And I, I can never remember going through these different hatchways. The ship, of course, had been secured for, for battle. And all. as you go forward, while you'd have these different compartments, you'd have to spin the wheel, open the door, go through, then close it. And I went back, go back to my room, see what if there was anything there. If the ship got hit back in the back part of the thing, so <clears throat> I finally made it back there. Everything was fine, and then I went outside. And a guy come up and he says, well, uh, could you give us some help up above? So I went up above. It was just terrible, all these guys that burned to death. There's one side of that ship where they had all these black stewards. There was 40 of them all that had been burned by the flames of this plane. There was two of them came in. One came in at a steep angle and he went down. And his bomb let loose and it hit below on the armor deck, which is next deck down, and then it blew. And then it put holes in all the ventilating systems, and then there was a couple planes down and set them on fire. The other one was at a shallower angle, and they went through. And the bomb proceeded to go through about three ready rooms. Finally got down by <coughs> the forward part of the ship, and it blew, and it knocked out an elevator. And all one elevator is already gone, so the ship was on fire from one end to the other. And so when I went outside there, I figured, God sakes, the well, next thing I ought to do is go get a, a life preserver. So I asked the guy, I said, where are the life preservers? He looked at me like, what are you doing up here without one? Well, of course, we're not in ship's company. We, you know, we flew airplanes out. He said, well, I'm sorry, sir. He says, they're over here, so I got a life preserver and went up and I helped him clean out a couple of places with using, uh, um, we used up, uh, what's the, uh, I try to think, a, a gurney uh, type thing to pick up these dead ones. Anyway, uh, finally the ship uh, his own sprinkling system finally put the fire out because yeah, at one time there was a couple ships came in close and used their own water was shooting up and they were ordered to be moved away because they thought the ship would be was going to be blowing up and then it would probably take that ship too so we were just going to sit out there and because we carry a tremendous amount of gasoline and fuel because we used to fuel every three weeks and every let's see every day or every two days we would fuel a, a destroyer and we had carried more ammunition in an ammunition ship and actually carried more fuel and I had one <coughs> guy in the Navy uh, he was a transport man he doubted whether we carried more fuel than a, than a um, one of those tankers but uh, but we get every three weeks we get a load of fuel from one of those big tankers. This was a secret weapon because the tankers at that time, they were capable of doing, uh, say, 18, 20 knots, and they would come up alongside and we would hook onto us and we would not even stop, just keep going and take on board thousands of gallons of fuel that we have to have for not only to run of the ship, but also for fuel for the aircraft. Because <coughs> there was a lot of aircraft on board one of those carriers. Basically, there was about 3,500 people on board the ship. Uh, we had uh, different guys who represented the New York Times and the Baltimore Sun. and it's About four papers were and these guys are sending reports, you know, for the deal. And of course, the biggest laugh would be was when we'd get a, a New York reporter would send in that MacArthur's planes and bombed so and so. 
Well, MacArthur's planes at that time, they weren't on on that Leyte yet because there wasn't any place for them to land. The nearest to them were to be a Australia, and of course they would maybe make it up halfway. But you know that was that was one of the political things that went on out there. MacArthur got a lot of credit for it, and he wasn't even near the place. So, anyway, that was the ship got hit, and uh, so we went back to to uh, Hawaii, to Oahu. The damage is so bad. They said, "Well, uh, the skipper announced he says, man, he says, I hate to tell you this, but he says the ship has been hit so bad that we're going to have to go back to Alameda." <laughs> He had a little chuckle in his voice, so I meant we were going home. So we took off and made it back to Alameda in three and a half days. It didn't slow the ship down any because that baby could go even with with only three props. He could do at least 33 knots. It was, it's hard to believe. But it. <clears throat> and now when you're talking about knots, you were talking about the these big battleships, the Iowa and New Jersey. When we were informed on uh, about the Jap fleet coming in, the the New Jersey was alongside over there, so it was close enough that we could see the weight coming off the thing. And they said the, they were going to go at the flank speed, and they literally, the back end of this huge ship went down, kind of like a racing boat, and all of a sudden it just took off. And it went off so fast that it left the destroyers, and the destroyers could do 35 knots. And somebody said, do you know that those ships would do 45 knots? I, I, don't, I don't doubt them, but 45 knots is a lot of speed. That's almost 50 miles an hour. To see one of those huge ships go that fast. Cause, you know, they're real long, but then you get alongside them, and they're just huge, because they're they got these huge blisters on each side, and you can't figure that they could ever push that much weight through. But I know that our ship was, when we get up to 33 knots, so we go out and look at the bow, and the water would come up, oh, about 60 feet, and come up like this in a big deal, and break over, and just like it was a knife cutting through this. It was really pretty to see those things on. But ours wouldn't go quite that fast because on the proceeding, before we got on board ship, a truck, it took a torpedo and the uh, concussion of the torpedo uh, had one of the shafts bent so that they only run on three three props. The only time they turn the fourth prop in is if we go faster than 33 knots, it turn in that fourth prop and then you knew because you could stand under the fan tail and it would vibrate real bad. But you, it was good enough that I think that was one reason why we went back because they wanted to get that other prop repaired. The props are so long on those things that they, um, when you're on standing anchored, uh, they keep the prop turning all the time because if they don't turn it, it's just the weight of the, of the shaft itself will go out of line, so they always keep the thing slowly turning. That's all. All, all three of all four of the processors, two on each side, one of them. It was vibrating so bad, in fact, that it had a airplane. One of the airplanes that are, didn't make it, and it got caught up in the prop and got wrapped around. So they were going to have to take it as dry dock. So anyway, <coughs> Here we got home on December 22nd, and I think I called Maryland up on the 23rd, said I was going to be home on 24th, <coughs> and I flew from, from San Diego to Seattle. Alameda. Alameda. Oh yeah, it was from Alameda is where I get home. Uh, it was open. It was, and that day it was six and a half hours. It's hard to believe. And that was flying a, well, they had DC threes, all completely covered, so you couldn't look out. Got in, and 
got home and I met my wife at People's Store and we clinched down there much of my mother-in-law's <laughs> chagrin. She went around and apologized and said, well, he's been gone for two years. <laughs> and so I said, well, when are we going to get married? She said, right away. And by golly, I had 30 days leave and I was married in about 20 days. 30th? What would it have been? Six days? <coughs> About ten days. Ten days, anyway. So that was in December of, of 44. And uh, we married, and then uh, I reported then uh, Seattle to reform a new squadron. By then, of course, I had more experience, and I was going to be a division leader instead of one of those guides that had to, <laughs> like a, we were ensign before we got it, had to follow everybody. I was going to be a leader from then on with war experience. So, uh, which I found out wasn't all that was cracked up to be either. And we went from uh, Seattle and then we went to um, Astoria, Oregon. And we opened an airfield down there, the first the Navy bought this, was their city airport, and they put all the beautiful towers in and did all the runways. And, well, it's still used today. It's a, it's a nice air. Navy did a lot of work like that. And so Army did too, went to different places. That these little small towns didn't have big enough airports. But we were there for at least three months. It was so bad that we we weren't getting enough flying hours in because the weather was so terrible. You know, there'd be days that we wouldn't fly. And then finally went down to San Diego. And of course, down there was nice weather. We get to fly. Then we got different airplanes. Big rumor is going to go by and say we we're going to get an F-9F instead of the bomber we were going to have, but it never fell through. It kind of fell through. Then he sent us to rocket training in the desert. We were first learned how to fire rockets. This is when they put rockets on the wings and we could carry 20 rockets. And they were equivalent to a five-inch shell. And we went to the desert. Maryland then learned how to be a Navy wife. <laughs> we went to the desert with, with 100 and 20 degrees of weather, but we had a good time, and got through rocket training, went back to to San Diego, and then he said, you know, it was, war was over, and anybody that had points to get out, well, I had so many points, I, I think I was about two days, war was over, I was on the road heading back for Seattle, that's my, where I joined was in Seattle, go back there to collect my $500 a year, which they didn't even, uh, didn't know about. It. Uh, so I told one of the uh, lieutenant commanders, I said, well, I said, you know, the reason I joined here in Seattle is that in the Navy is the fact they were going to pay a, a commission that could pay a $500 a year for anybody that joined the Navy and he said, well, I heard about that. So he come back and he says, you're right. He says, I got it right here on the information. He says, so here, you got about $2,000 coming, <laughs> which was nice, along with the severance pay. It wasn't too long, that, you know, that the things all broke up. A lot of guys stayed in. There was quite a few of them. Uh, the, Fellows, when our squadron was reformed after we got back, some went to the east. Those that lived in the east went there, and those of the west went to the west. So we are squadron 18 then broke up. <coughs> but we were really squadron 18 uh, even after we broke up. We reformed. We still retained our squadron. The ones went east were different. So that would be the. That would be my war career. If there's any questions, why go ahead and shoot. Um, when you went on the bombing run, you said it was on your birthday. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how old were you, had you just turned? Twenty-four. What was your group called? Why? We called the Sunday Punchers. <laughs> and we, our squadron was VB-18, uh, VB standing for uh, bomber group, and uh, 18 was a designate, and uh, we said Sunday punches. The fact is that we never missed a Sunday on going on uh, on a bomb bombing mission out on the what is it combat. So someone said you didn't get a chance to go to church. Most of us did go to church. There weren't very many people out there that. That didn't. It was a, it's a tough goal. What was it like in San Diego, <coughs> Navy Town, on the night that the war was over? It was, oh, it was a. That was a beautiful, beautiful thing. I mean, I can remember the streets were full of people dancing, and yeah. we just. It was hard to believe that the the war was over. I mean, it just. All I could think of was get home and <clears throat> start raising children. <laughs> How many missions did you end up flying? I flew 21 missions. Most of us all got it. Because we, uh, we got shorted. We were supposed to be, we got hit in uh, uh, be November. We got back, it was in December, and we weren't supposed to leave that area out there until April or March or April of the following year because the, that by then we'd have probably around 40 missions. But those, our missions, I had more missions there, but missions actually mean we fly over enemy territory and have enemy contact. I did a lot of uh, what we called anti sub patrols, which we flew. And this was a protection deal. We fly to cover areas out in front of our our group of ships, so that we, there weren't any submarines that would sneak in on us and come back to the ship. In fact, we had uh, one of the guys that we'd lost so many pilots. We had three guys we picked up off of jeep carriers that. Had landed on board and they've been on board this jeep carrier for like three months and this is the first time they'd flown and, and one of the i know the landing signal officer we went out to see these guys come in because we figured they were going to have a tough time and this landing signal officer says well next time if that guy doesn't come down i'm going to get my shotgun and shoot him down poor guy had been, hadn't been on a been on the carrier but hadn't been able to you know, take off. They were just replacement pilots. Kind of a rough deal. And one of them, uh, second mission, he went on a anti sub patrol and got lost. And he was picked up like 11 days later. And he had lost, I don't know, 35, 40 pounds. And the guy was kind of fat when he went on the deal. When he came back, he was nice and tan and real thin. You know, the guy kept saying, you well, look a hell of a lot better than, than when you left the ship, <laughs> which made him kind of mad. But anyway. What percentage of your squadron did you lose? Well, it was between 30 and 35 percent. Most of, believe it or not, most of it wasn't in combat. Most of it was in operational. We lost about 48 percent in operational accidents. Almost half of the guys were killed in different things. We even had one guy that well, it was a real cloudy day flying out of Alameda, which is right close to Oakland. And we did a field carrier landing, which we fly off the ground at about 200 feet and fly out a pattern, came off the ground, and then land on this. Uh, so-called mark on the ground and the size of a carrier and that that's where we learned how to you know keep our planes under control but 
the fog came in, we kept getting longer and longer and longer, and this one guy flew right through the Oakland Bay Bridge. The only thing that came up was one, one tire, one wheel with a tire on it, and I never did find him. But there was so many things that happened. You know, one night a fella just all of a sudden just kind of slid out of the formation and just kept a gentle glide like he was gliding down and finally he hit the ground. We'd find it about 12,000 feet at night. <coughs> Couldn't figure out whether he must have fallen asleep. But they found out what had happened is that uh, if you had the window cracked a certain deal, which you have your canopy uh, and uh, exhaust pipe, and he was bringing enough exhaust in that he could have had uh, the exhaust probably sitting asleep, killed him. <coughs> but you know, we, everybody kept yelling at him. To, I mean, everybody knew who it was. He was a full blooded Indian, and he was good speed. When you were landed on carriers, you you had a hook yeah. on the plane that attached mm. to those cables. Yeah, that must have been real interesting trying to do that at night. Yeah, it's the most horrible experience I've ever had. Is they're flying in on a carrier at night, and I the other day I was watching some guys on the jets. And they were they were talking about this night carrier landing, what a horrible thing it was. So it hasn't gotten any better, even in the jets. See, in our case, uh, like in the jet, when he hits the deck, and then he gives full power in, until he's engaged. Well, us, we could, it wouldn't do any good to get full power, because if you get hooked on a cable, why, that's, that was it. Because you never did, some of the guys would, you know, get airborne and they pour on the power because their hook wasn't engaged and the plane would either break off to one side or the other. The planes we were flying on had a tendency to left wing to drop. You would lose and it would go off. And then, of course, you're 60 feet, is the flight takes 60 feet from the water. That is much room to recover. Were there multiple cables? So if you missed the first yeah. one, was there another one? Yeah. We had about five cables. Each one got stiffer as you went up the line. First cable we got would stretch out, it was just like, you know, like a big rubber band. The second cable was, you know, a little more stubby. But boy, to get up number four cable. That baby would grab you, and you wanted to have your head back on that cushion here. You, it was really slappy down in a hurry. You got so you know it was not bad landing because it was fairly automatic, but you still used to have to really sweat and strain because in the case of the plane we had is. Uh, they had cowl flaps that would open up, and of course that was right in the line of you look out your side of your window and look down there to feel the cowl flaps. So right there would open up so that the, you couldn't see the landing signal officer. So you used to cl close the cowl flaps, and your visibility wasn't as good. Now I, you see these jets, and they have this set out the end of that point. There's no prop out in front. Everything is in back. They have a lot better visibility. But of course, they're landing at 120 miles an hour, where we're landing at 80, <coughs> 75 or 80 knots. They're landing at 120. Uh, you had a name for your plane? Where did it come from? Uh, my plane was called Lucky Penny. Uh, the guy that was the plane captain, uh, he was part of the crew of the USS Intrepid. Uh, his wife was named Penny, and he asked me if I could, if he could name a, and I told him, yeah, and so when they went out there, and here was written on the side, Lucky Penny. Uh, I would maybe fly the thing, maybe out of the 20 missions, I probably flew it four times. It just depended on 
It would depend on, you know, your assignment of what plane you got. You know, it didn't always get your own plane. Of course, when a gunner and I got our first aircraft, it was ours assigned and we would, were land-based. Well, we got out and we polished the thing all up. Got about five knots faster out of it. His <coughs> paint jobs on those are pretty crude. They're real rough. We polished it all down. <coughs> Did you ever make any landings, land landings, any of those islands that the Americans recaptured? No. Um, our our group did. Our group landed on Leyte. It was after the ship was hit. Uh, they had to wait until they got an assignment to for another ship, and they landed on, uh, I believe it was a Hancock. The next day they flew out and landed on the Hancock, and then they were delivered over by boat uh, to our ship. And we, they kept our planes because the, the replacement was about what they needed anyway. Then they all went on board. Our, that's when we were sent back to Alameda, to, or I sent back to first to uh, to Honolulu to get fixed up because we had we have three uh, uh, elevators on the thing, and all three of them are. One was jammed, the other two had dropped clear to the bottom, so they were uh, weren't operable. Didn't you say at one time that you something about you threw your wings in? Everybody on the flight threw the wings? That's when they told us we were going to take off at 6 o'clock in the evening and go fly, make contact with the uh, at about nine o'clock at night, we made contact with the Japanese fleet and bomb them by radar, and then come back to the ship. Which meant we would, first of all, we wouldn't get back to the ship because we wouldn't have enough gasoline. Second of all, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have enough. Anyway, that's when we found out that we were expendable. But then they. interrupt me okay well my assignment is to talk about what it was like on the home front because that's where I was and my husband and I had dated a long time before the war and I saw his growing interest in aviation and I didn't know whether to be pleased or not pleased it was a pretty um, unusual field at that time not very many people were interested in doing that and I was afraid for him, but I also thought it was pretty romantic and pretty exciting. He took me <coughs> up one day in his little, uh, was it a Piper Cub? Mm -hmm. And we waved at my mother down below, who was clenching her hands and worrying over the whole experience. And then as the war got closer and closer, we began to get more and more worried about him going in. I was in college, and so my, my life became uh, defined by letter letters received and letters sent i always wrote to him in green ink so that when he got a letter uh, on board ship the person handing out the letters would just yell out green ink and he'd put his hand up and he'd know that was for me we were um, engaged just before he became engaged just before he went uh, overseas and uh, so life became a a matter of waiting and waiting, not knowing how long anything was going to take. We heard stories about it may go on for eight, nine years, and I thought, my goodness, I'm going to be an old lady by the time I get married. But fortunately, it didn't take that long. 
during the year that we, the first year we were married, um, uh, very late in, in 1944, of course the following uh, early spring, President Roosevelt died, which was a shock to the name, to the nation because uh, I could hardly remember of having had any other president. He had been in office for so long. My big thrill at turning 21 was to get to go into a voting place and cast my vote for president. Uh, and I did vote for uh, Franklin Roosevelt. We voted in a little grocery store and we got in line and wended our way up and down the aisles and finally the big moment came and I cast my vote and that was pretty exciting for me. The beginning of a long <coughs> life of moderate interest in politics, I guess you might say. Uh, Don was over there a long, long time, it seemed to me, and when he finally came back, I wasn't sure I would even remember what he looked like. But sure enough, I did recognize him, and, uh, uh, but I was very glad when the war was over for him. After we were married, though, uh, they received more training, as he was telling you about, and uh, he was just beginning to be, get uneasy about being sent back out again in the summer of um, 45, when the atomic bomb was dropped and uh, we knew that the war was soon to be over and we came home from San Diego and began a, a civilian life. Uh, he did uh, follow up though with uh, being in the reserves for quite a long time uh, at Sandpoint Naval Air Station. How did you feel when he called to tell you he was coming home? Well, I was pretty shocked. I had no idea that he would be home that soon. I was expecting him in March, and of course, this the they did not want it uh, known that his ship was hit by a kamikaze because they didn't want the Japanese to understand how successful those <coughs> kamikaze attacks were. And so I was not to say anything when I did find out why he was home earlier than expected. But that was pretty nice. Uh, during the war years, the <laughs> college life was uh, pretty tame. There were none, no young men around uh, to speak of. Uh, college dances were pretty hard to scare up a date for, but those years did pass. But you dated a CO? Yes, for a while. It was strange though, this young man was uh, heart and soul a conscientious objector, um, could see no reason for ever going to war, and the Monday morning after the attack of Pearl Harbor, he enlisted, much to my amazement. He uh, went into the service and became a pilot uh, of a B-25 over uh, Germany. Did you find out much about uh, like where uh, he was going and things like that through letters and things, or did he he wasn't allowed to tell you? He was not allowed to tell us where where he was. Uh, the name of his ship was stamped on money orders that he sent home for safekeeping, but uh, uh, no, we did not know. And but we, I would keep reading about these Sunday punchers. And I, I didn't know that it was always his group. I thought, well, it might be one group one time and another group another. But it was always his group. So I'd been reading about him, never knowing that it was he. Were your letters censored at all? Did anybody read your mail that went back and forth? I, uh, his letters were censored, weren't they? Yep. But I was a censoring I officer. I did my own. But mine were not. <laughs> did you cut holes out of your own letters? <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, I can't say that. Cut, cut, cut. <laughs> it was interesting, though, because I had all the enlisted personnel and I'd read their letters, you know, to make sure that they didn't have. And this one guy had a gal who was a full blooded Hawaiian. Uh, she, she's half Hawaiian, half Chinese, and then she had another girl back in Iowa. And he would send identical letters to each, each one of them. Hmm. 
Marilyn, besides the letters from Don, where did you get most of your information about what was going on? Newspapers. Newspapers? And uh, some from the radio, and then we had the Pathé News at the theaters. We always got a news uh, broadcast. Did you ever not want to know news for fear of you'd hear something bad? No, because uh, uh, when someone was lost, uh, their families were notified right away as near as they could. Mm. In the case of a pilot, they would be pretty sure to know. Missing in action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What were some of the differences that you saw during those years uh, in terms of day-to-day um, -day life? Day-to-day uh, -day life, of course, grew into a sort of routine, but there were many, many things that we couldn't buy in the stores. Uh -huh. uh, lots of things were curtailed, sugar was curtailed, and bananas were a big treat. We could only buy three pairs of shoes, uh, leather shoes, a year. If you wanted to buy um, cloth shoes, <coughs> you could get as many of those as you wanted. Um, the problem with the shoes was that if you bought a pair of heels, um, the metal in the shank was very poor and it would usually break. And so you would be hobbling around on shoes that were kind of going like that under your foot. So things were of a poor quality, generally speaking, I think. Uh, after uh, I graduated from college uh, in June of 44, I went to work at the uh, Tacoma shipyards in the payroll office. And uh, I didn't make any ships, but I went out to pay uh, the checks to the fellows who were cutting the patterns from the plans. They would have a plan and then they would cut plans out of plywood, and then the metal itself was cut from the plywood patterns. And that's what they were doing there. And that was interesting, and I did that about six months. Mainly I got the job because my cousin was head paymaster. That uh, type of shipbuilding was initiated uh, because it was faster, and then also the, before they would use rivets, and rivets would have, there was an explosion, and the rivets would blow out, and they would become more dangerous than the shells themselves. So, this is when they first started using weld. Weld was a lot stronger then. I was on one of the ships that was built in Tacoma. We called them jeep carriers because they were small. <clears throat> the, remember the cook on board that guy knew how to make cinnamon rolls. Oh my, they were doing. There was two of us went on board, and I know that one of the ship's officers was down in the wardroom was telling him about the integrity of his ship, and he says, "You know that this ship it would take four torpedoes for it to sink." And the guy says, well, I know how it would sink. He says, one would hit the ship and the other two would pass over the flight deck. <laughs> that made him kind of mad, but we kind of laughed about it. <coughs> yeah. They were using just for storage of extra planes, you know, that we needed out there. In fact, one of the you know, that came out was brand new planes came out a model. Let's see, was SBW fours, and we got a whole new models of fives came out, and they took and dumped all the fours overboard. Then we went to these Jeep carriers and flew the new ones off of that deal. <coughs> Had new aircraft, <coughs> almost. <laughs> Marilyn, when you were here in Tacoma, did did you ever have to practice or go through air raid drills or um, things like that? Yes, we did, and we had uh, blackout curtains on all the windows. Um, we had sandbags on every corner in case of incendiary bombs. Um, those were the main things. Um, 
men in, who were in the service were not supposed to be out without having their uniforms on. I was out on a date one time with a fellow who had gotten into civilian clothes and very nearly was in some trouble for that. Um, of course, being near Fort Lewis, we were used to having a lot of servicemen around. But uh, not, <coughs> except for the deprivations of certain things that we couldn't buy. Uh, of course, everybody was worried. Don's mother was terribly worried about him. Uh, life was routine, came to be routine except that uh, life had not worked out in the, exactly the same way we'd all thought it would for a few years. Contrast your experience with World War II with the um, Korean War and the Vietnam War. Well, by the time that those wars came along, we were married, had children. Uh, Don, when the Korean War came along, he was... Uh, still in the reserves. Uh, later, <coughs> shortly after that, he, he left for medical reasons, but um, I did not want him to go in. When he first finished, he came back and went back to school in the GI Bill, which was a wonderful, wonderful uh, present to give all the servicemen, because they could come back and uh, uh, go to school, everything, tuition, um, I think there was a stipend for family support. Every bit of supplies that they needed was all covered by the government, and it was a wonderful thing. All they had to do was keep their grades up to a certain level. Um, and then when he finished, uh, surprisingly, he had a hard time finding a job. And he wanted to get into the CAA, but there were so many people there ahead of him that uh, had had uh, experience in heavy planes. So yeah. Civilian Air Corps? Don't yes, uh -huh. that he was way down on the list and knew that he had to do something <coughs> something different. But he, um, he went to work for this wholesale grocery company and then he uh, stayed in the reserves. And uh, so which meant that he would be, he could have been called up had he not uh, then, in the meantime, uh, been given a medical leave because of his thyroid problems. How old were you during the entire war time? Well, I was um, 22 at the time, I had just turned 22 at the time that uh, we got married. So it was my years between 18 and 22 when I was in college, when the war was brewing and then when it was on and <clears throat> finally over then. We were not as close on the Pacific Coast. We weren't nearly as close or involved as involved with the uh, European War as we were with the Pacific War. It seemed like a long ways away. Most of our, well, a lot of the fellows were. One boy I knew in college was killed over Africa uh, in the Army Air Force. He was one of the early ones. <clears throat> but uh, it was mostly my college years. So were you giving, were you given mostly information about the Pacific or more information in Europe or just kind of well, we didn't have the national news like we do now. It was pretty, I would say, pretty much mostly uh, uh, concentrated on the war in the Pacific. We knew it was going on, of course, in, in Europe, and the newspapers, you know, told us quite a bit. But uh, our main concern was the Pacific War, and, of course, we had a large population of Japanese that were then interned, and that was a source of concern for most of the people in this area, because many of us had gone to school with Japanese, had known them, had patronized their vegetable shops, and, uh, knew them one way and another.
Well, um, thanks for the time for interviewing you guys. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Anytime. <laughs>